Okay, 6.05. All right, sorry for the delay, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is part of the Academic City University College uh, Technology and Entrepreneurship Center Innovation Series. Um, so thank you for joining. Um, I would like to introduce our uh, guest speaker for today. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Blaise Bayou. Uh, he is the former CEO of uh, Retail Tower, uh, which was acquired by Kudo Buzz in uh, 2018, I believe. Um, he holds a uh, MSc in Innovation Studies from Lund University in Sweden. Um, his more recent company is, uh, he's built a product, a blockchain product, Ccash, uh, on BitShares, um, before moving it over to Telos Blockchain. Um, and, uh, he is currently the CEO, uh, and founder of, uh, Yensasa product, or excuse me, of Yensasa Company Limited. Um, so we have... We have Blaze here uh, joining us today. He's one of our uh, partners. Uh, we've partnered with Blaze and his company specifically on their, uh, on their innovative technology focused on weather data collection um, using uh, innovative technologies such as blockchain solutions. Um, and uh, we're excited to partner with Blaze. You know, this, uh, this gives us a, a cool opportunity uh, for our students uh, and the community at Academic City, um, you know, to, to understand what Blaze and his team are doing, uh, the initiative they're working towards, uh, the solution and impact they're looking to achieve and the support, you know, they're looking for from you know, students such as the likes of Academic City students, um, as well as the Academic City community, right? So with that, uh, I'll pass it over to Blaze. I believe he has a couple of team members to potentially introduce, uh, as well as a short presentation. Uh, and then we'll do, uh, we'll do a quick uh, Q&A at the end, um, in case there are any questions. Um, but with that, uh, I'd like to pass it on to, uh, to Mr. Blaze. Thank you for joining us today, Blaze. Yeah. And, and thank you, Paul, for the um, kind and nice introduction. And good, good evening to everybody for making time to join um, us in this uh, webinar session. Um, together in this presentation, I'd like to introduce some of the um, colleagues, um, co-founders um, behind uh, Kanda Weather Balloons and, within the, and also within the SSR team. So first is um, um, Nick Lopez. Um, he's an engineer and he is based in the U.S. Um, I think he's one of the an, an attendees with us here. And then during the presentation or during Q&A, if there's any question, Nick um, would chip in as well. Um, next is Emmanuel Patrick. Um, he's also an engineer um, um, based in Nigeria, Port Harcourt. And he's also been active in, um, you know, launching in Nigeria, partaking in engineering development and, you know, um, building the product. So these are the three um, core members um, of um, Canada Weather Balloons. And we are working um, closely with uh, other partners, blockchain teams, and also other local partners looking at how we can, you know, expand across Africa. You know, with this background, I'll then proceed to um, share my screen and then make my presentation. Um, I'll try to be as brief as possible, as Puff said, so we can have uh, more time for engagement and then um, deliberations. So um, to kickstart, I'll say, um, so the yeah, team um, behind Kanda Weather Balloons have the vision that we should empower local communities um, within Africa to be able to collect, you know, real-time weather data for their daily use and also for prediction and modeling purposes. And so the project um, collects real-time weather data that local um, communities, regional authorities and national authorities as well um, can have access to this data and use it um, for planning purposes and also to be able to predict future and historical events. And so um, our mission is simple, build a community-owned network of um, um, weather balloon launches across um, different cities and across different countries across the globe. 
And so um, university students, for instance, can become local um, climate change leaders and pioneer the process to um, empowering local communities, vulnerable communities in this whole process. And our uh, vision uh, really is that um, we should be able to um, decentralize the process of collecting weather data uh, beyond making it centralized where we don't have access to it. We are already decentralizing it and giving um, the individual, the local communities, the power to understand, predict, and also model their own local climatic conditions and use it for whatever purposes they want to. And this is what um, the vision we are trying to build, empowering the individual, the local community in accessing and gathering local weather um, data and also using it in real time for whatever they want to do. Um, within West Africa and almost Africa at large, um, there's a trend where there's a poor weather data collection. And so, in fact, data is almost unavailable and climate, climate data is not re reliable and it's not available to end users in real time. Uh, well, you can't blame um, the authorities. Sometimes they are under-resourced um, to collect these stations. And most weather stations in Africa use legacy technologies that are outdated and the sensors are not able to pick um, real-time real information. And also maintaining these weather stations is expensive. And if you've been to um, a weather station in Ghana before, um, most of them are in a deplorable state and are poorly um, resourced to run this effectively. Um, then the question then comes to um, how do we decentralize this, this process? Instead of having a centralized body like the weather station, um, picking this data and making it inaccessible to us, how do we decentralize the process and make it um, um, accessible to everyone such that each stakeholder can use this data for whatever purpose it is. And also making it real time. And over years, we then built a historical data set that can be used for predictive purposes and modeling. And we um, came up with a very simple solution that you know, is cheap and as well uh, would provide real time weather data um, for um, planning and also prediction purposes. And we're using weather balloons um, as a grid line of sight and also allowing um, the balloons to, um, when floated into the atmosphere to send back packets of data to the ground. And this data is um, reflected or updated on the blockchain in real time and allows anybody to pick this data and use it for whatever purposes they want to. And so we are um, using Internet of Things technology, um, which is open source hardware sensors with 3D boxes and then the balloons are floated with um, the sensors into the atmosphere, and then they pick this data and send it down to um, the local um, um, server, which receives these packets of data and processes it, processes it onto the blockchain um, for easy access. And we chose to build this on the blockchain because you know it provides two benefits. One is the decentralization, and I've explained that already, and also that we have historical storage. And so blockchain provides a cheaper way to store data and also to, it promotes open access because it's a public blockchain network. And secondly, that we can use blockchain for incentivization. So we are tokenizing the process that once as when somebody launches a, um, a, a balloon onto the atmosphere, they are rewarded with cryptocurrency or local um, currency. And so they choose to either take the payments in um, the local currency or in a crypto of their choice. But we are starting with Telos. And so this is how we are using blockchain process to uh, um, improve um, weather data collections and to build a community and incentivize individuals, student groups to be part of this process. Um, a snapshot of um, the technology that we are employing one is the balloon. So we are using um, biodegradable balloons, which are filled with helium gas or hydrogen gas. And so this helps the balloon to float um, to the atmosphere. And also we attach um, a parachute to um, ensure a safe landing when the um, balloon is returning down to the ground and also protect the damages that may occur to um, the microcontrollers. And we are using the payload device as well, which is an ESP32 microcontroller. And this um, has sensors to measure temperature, pressure, and humidity as well. And now, whatever data it um, captures while it's in the atmosphere, it sends this back to the ground, um, to the receiver, and this is processed and then updated on the blockchain. And here also are the 3D um, cases, and that is where we put in the, um, the payload device. The microcontroller is put into a 3D um, case, and then helps it also to uh, protect against humid conditions as it you know, floats into the atmosphere. Um, next then is uh, we put a battery to charge um, or to start the, um, the payload device so that it can keep alive for up to 12 hours and more. 
And so we are looking to improve that it can stay longer in the atmosphere. And then is the helium tank, which um, is filled with um, helium gas. And so two balloons can be filled with one helium tank. Um, but also for um, other uses, you can also use the PM electrolyzer. And this produces hydrogen that is also able to fill the balloons and help it flow. Then next is the kite string. This is just maybe I could, should say in local balance a thread that you can use to tie the balloon to the payload so that as the balloon floats, the payload is attached to it so that you know it can pick the um, data and then send it back um, to the receiver on the ground. And then we have the B, BME 280, which is um, connects to the payload and helps to measure um, the, the data sets that are being picked by the payload. Um, how do we combine all these technologies? One is that the balloon is inflated using the helium gas. So usually you would fill the balloon with helium using with a helium tank or PM, PME, PM electrolyzer, and then you inflate it. Now, then you then attach the TTGO um, um, uh, microcontroller to the balloon with a ribbon or with a um, local tray, if I should say, and then we float it um, to the atmosphere. So it sends the, my, the sensors up into the air and can pick this data. And of course, the parachute um, is also attached to a 3D case for safe landing, as I explained. And then we are then using the blockchain for synchronization. So the point is that there are different individuals launching um, the devices across different cities um, and in real time. So the blockchain helps to synchronize all these devices, um, all these launches, and then uh, syncs them into a one data set that in any individual can pick sort it out and use it for whatever uh, uh, modeling or um, um, use case they have. And so, and the blockchain also provides like an inexpensive way to store the data. You know, we have access to um, storage space in terms of RAM. And this helps us, you know, to save costs and make the process cheaper other than going the traditional way um, to doing so. Um, well, why are we better than others? We are cheaper uh, to implement and that is the ideal way and the reason why we are doing this. We want to make it cheaper and make the everyday person be able to afford it or the vulnerable communities to afford this whole process. And uh, it costs just about $55 to implement the payload. Yes, I mean, in some local contests is still expensive, but we are working hard to um, reduce the cost. And that's one of the reasons we are working with um, Academic City, that in the long term through R&D um, and with the students and the university, we can find ways to reduce the cost to the barest minimum. Um, and that is something we are looking forward to. And also that we provide real-time data um, as the balloons are up and um, sending packets of data this is reflected on the blockchain other than uh, you know having a time lag with most traditional weather stations where we get the data maybe in 12 hour intervals in this case all the data sets that we are gathering are reflected on the blockchain and you can use that to even plan your trip for the next day or for the next hour that is the um, vision and the goal that we are aiming towards and it is community owned and for us that's also the good thing about um, these thing processes like communities like universities farmer based groups can own and launch the balloons and have access to this data for their own um, unique use um, cases right and it's open source which means um, the code base is public and, <clears throat> and most of the technologies are also uh, um, you know public as well so anybody can deploy similar applications use our code base to improve or build a different use case and that is what we we are promoting um, and as i explained it's blockchain powered and we are using the telos blockchain to process the data and payments um, the data types collected are uh, temperature uh, which we captured you look at the different um, the changes in temperature in the atmosphere and this um, is also captured real time we also measure pressure and as it rises, we get a difference in pressure as the balloon rises into higher heights. And humidity as well. So we also capture the humid conditions. And this can help forecast rainfall patterns, let's say, in six hours in advance, other than you know, I'm waiting for a longer period to do so. And the, the, with a balloon, as it moves in less than 200 hours, with visual side, you can determine wind speed and also wind direction. But as it goes beyond or above 200 feet, we are using GPS to help determine the wind speed and the directions and to measure um, some of these data sets. So this is how we are uh, making the process cheaper and also collecting as much data sets as we can to improve um, data, uh, climate and weather, you know, uh, modeling and prediction. Um, some of the use cases really are as simple as, you know, for local agricultural purposes. So farmers um, can be able to 
predict or understand the historical antecedents of um, low rainfall patterns, um, temperature patterns, and then they can, you know, predict the next farming season. And also that they can understand probably the um, humid conditions over the period and understand which types of crops they should plant or um, depending on the conditions, what actions they have to take. So this is the um, one of the use cases. And we're also looking at weather companies that they can access the raw data, um, use it to model and also use that in their weather forecast and presentations as we see on TV stations. We, are, we hope to, we are planning to become the source of data for all these weather companies. And we're also looking at emergency, emergency services providers. So for instance, predicting the next storm or um, the next um, rainfall that is to come and to cause flooding, um, our technology should be able to provide the data for that. And also that the modeling services that we are providing can send alerts to individuals to be able to understand some of these impending um, uh, maybe disasters or emergencies uh, that are going to come and then the best actions they can take. Now, drone operations is an important area. In Ghana, for instance, we have Zipline that is providing drone services for um, the health sector. And now um, rain uh, and storm affect drone uh, um, effectiveness. And so, you know, our data and services can provide them with real time information regarding how to schedule um, drone deliveries and flights across um, different cities. And also, the purpose of this is decentralization that the individual will be able to also access this, this data and inform their own planning purposes. So, if you wanted to make a trip to Kumasi and then you realize that, um, you know, this is the rainfall pattern or this is the humid conditions, you can probably reschedule your own um, trip and plan effectively. So these are some of the use cases, but not limited to this. There are many more use cases um, for the data sets and for our technology. So the launch steps to, um, uh, is, are pretty simple. So the balloon launcher or the miner is, a miner is somebody who launches a balloon every day. And so, for instance, you saw the guy holding the balloon to let go into the atmosphere. So such a person is called a miner or a launcher. And um, once they launch the balloon successfully and send data onto the blockchain, they, they are paid instantly in less than 10 minutes. And that is um, the incentive model that we are picking uh, and putting in place. And so the process starts with um, the user inputting his um, or her sister cash account. So sister cash, sister cash is a sister um, fintech company that uh, processes payments um, to uh, individuals across Africa using cryptocurrency and local uh, currency as well. If you don't, don't have a Sister Cash account, you can also scan a QR code on the device and then we can pick that um, uh, immediately. So you insert the battery, which I explained earlier, into the uh, microcontroller. And then once you begin picking data, as the balloon goes into the atmosphere, um, and you begin sending packets of data, you get paid after 10 minutes. Um, once we receive the data after a certain height, then your payment is done. You receive the payment in your mobile money wallet. In the case of Ghana, Nigeria, you get it in your bank account. Um, if, you, if it is crypto, it reflects in your Bitcoin wallet or your Telos account. So that is what it is. And this all happens in real time. Um, business model we are looking at is pretty simple that we are looking at subscription services for SMS alerts. So um, individuals or organizations can su subscribe and then get you know, alerts based on um, the weather data that we get. So we're also going to build our own models uh, for prediction um, and, and this will generate reports that you know, individuals can get alerts and use for different purposes. We also have business accounts for weather companies and they will have a different set of um, view of the data and, and our prediction models, which they can also use for um, their reporting. And then we can, we're we going to build uh, prediction models, as I said, for drone companies. So that would be a different use case. And all these are uh, individuals who pay. And then we then use this money to re incentivize local communities or individuals to then launch the balloons every day. So this is how the flow is. We get money from uh, paid ent entities and subscriptions. And we use that to incentivize students who launch um, the balloon every day or incentivize a farmer group who launches the balloon um, every day. Um, so I'll just play um, a video summary of uh, what we do and then to it summarizes almost everything. Just give me a few minutes. The solution of weather and climate problems is finally here. The Delocanda Weather Group takes on this challenge, making use of biodegradable weather balloons, microcontrollers, hydrogen or helium gas, and green energy. Our team of three, based in Nigeria, Ghana, and the USA, makes use of a minor app connected to TTN and Telos blockchain 
to collect whether that uh, and our team member Mr. Blaze Boyo, who is a bit a sister guys business developer, helps to complement the effort of our technical personnel, Imano Patrick and Nick Lopez, to reward weekly launches with cash. Our data is used to make a 12-hour rain forecast to protect against flash flooding of areas with vulnerable children and to remotely forecast weather and climate to help support farmers in West Africa. Our revenue model is gotten from SMS subscription by farmers and people who need weather forecasts without the internet. Our distant future revenue would also come from private weather companies looking to make hurricane forecasts for Africa, USA and Europe. The hydrogen which fills up our biodegradable weather balloon is generated through PEM electrolysis and it is powered by a green energy supply from our solar panels. We do launches every week making use of Cantina 4610 microcontroller pre-installed with BME 280 temperature, pressure and humidity sensor a TTGO LoRa 32 to track the GPS of our balloon, a UG87 outdoor gateway for receiving data packets from the Cantina 4610 up in the sky, so, and a 12 inches parachute for safe landing of the balloons and the 3D boxes without causing accidents in areas where the hydrogen or helium balloon lands. We are the Telokanda Weather Group. We are the weather and climate solution. Okay. Um... Yeah, so that was um, a simple video um, explaining all that we do, the technology and everything. And the presenter there is Emmanuel, who is here with us. Um, he's based in Nigeria, um, Port Harcourt. And so, um, Emmanuel, thank you for uh, doing this. Um, so if you want to start a launch, um, if you're interested and you want to start a launch, you just need to acquire all the devices. They're open source and you can configure them on your own. But for now, what we do is that we pre-configure them and send them to all interested um, parties. Um, but in the long run, uh, we expect individuals to be able to configure all these. Or we also plan to use, uh, maybe let me go into the future before I get there, as there may be academic city, as maybe the uh, they, they, they lab to produce them locally or to assemble them locally here in, in Ghana. And then we can then distribute it um, to other local communities in a faster and cheaper way across West Africa and in Ghana in particular. And then the successes so far, we uh, have done three launches in Nigeria, USA. Um, and the data is live on the blockchain and payments are sent every day. And we are looking to launch in um, Kenya and Senegal soon. But uh, we are processing, and that's part of this webinar, to um, launching in Ghana and also expanding to all other regions in Ghana as well. But in the long run, we want to expand across all uh, West Africa and other African countries. And um, if this sounds interesting and you want to join, uh, please get in touch with us. And also we are looking to get up to five people, but not limited to five. And we are looking at, um, in this case, I'm referring to students of Academic City. And so the idea is that students will become ambassadors and more like in training local communities, like a trainer of trainers. And so you uh, would work with us in also, um, you know, championing the idea, reaching out to local, training them how to set up and launch the balloons. And we're also looking at internship opportunities uh, to develop the hardware components and also contribute to the blockchain code. So if there are students who are interested in this regard, um, we are open to that as well. Um, and then we are looking at further development of the system. So this is an, an, an area that we are looking to collaborate with um, students. And also want to coordinate um, to develop this with students. So uh it are student projects let me say so if a student wants to work on part of it as part of their semester project uh, we can also discuss that and then look at how we can support maybe in resources and also in time as well and also yeah the good news is that if you become part of this you earn some daily income as you launch this you get some income you know to support whatever that you are doing and, and we are open to having more people so it's not limited to just five um, the more the merrier as we say um, the next steps really uh, that we want to do demo launches uh, from 10 December to 10 January. So we'll do that with the, the interested students. We'll launch some, some of the uh, balloons on Academic City and see it live on the blockchain. Um, and so once we have that and we are conversant with the process and we've done enough um, you know, research and interactions, we then do a full launch. We are looking at 15th to 30th January after we all return from the um, uh, break. 
And so, and by then we should also have students on campus. So that's what we are looking at. Um, so we can have maybe a bigger launch with press and other um, stakeholders invited, invited to come uh, and join and see um, the process. And that will also kickstart our expansion to other communities outside Accra. Um, and so we, are, we want to do this in partnership with um, Academic City, um, the students and the university at large. Um, we have some resources that you can explore. We have our GitHub repository where the project code base is, as I said, it's open source and you can um, download the code base and start contributing. And we also have the smart contract um, on the blockchain where the data is live um, and you can see all that is happening. So for this, let me just um, also go to the smart contract and kind of give us um, an overview of um, what it is on the blockchain. Um, so this is the Telos blockchain and here we have our smart contract. I hope you can see the screen, yeah. And so um, you can see the launches. These are the different um, individuals who are launching it every day uh, from different locations and the types of devices that they have. So you have the, the miner, the name of the miner, the device, device type and the level that, you know, the balloon got to the atmosphere. So this is data that uh, we collect and then you look at the observations. So these are some of the data points that are coming in. And also um, the weather stations that you have. This uh, like this was launched in Oyo, Nigeria, and so um, uh, we are picking all these. And then you know it's on the blockchain. Of you can also come to um, the actions and you see all the launches that are coming. The latest one was 27th November, and all the data types, temperature, humidity, um, that are all being sent onto the blockchain. So and this data is public and it's available for anybody who is willing to um, use it um, for any purpose. Um, yeah, so this is the team. I think this has been explained so much in the video and also in my um, pre-introduction. So, uh, so I wouldn't say much about the team. And so we are three and we, we are looking to expand, getting more people on board. And so if anybody's interested, please get in touch and then we can all build this together and grow it. Thank you. And then yeah, the floor is open for any question, contributions, and then yeah, we can then discuss and interact. Thank you for your attention and I appreciate it. Thank you, Blaze. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, extremely insightful. Um, I just, I was just curious if you could just run us through, you know, um, what, what got you into this project initially? Yeah, I think so. What we're looking at is um, the um, process in uh, West Africa where we're always looking at how we can get real-time uh, data and also that um, we've had disasters re recently if you look at even um, in Ghana for instance you have so much flooding and also in uh, even in the, in the era of COVID-19 that was one of the factors we are looking at uh, it may not be related but this also helps in times of disaster so we are looking at how can we employ technology to help relieve or, or mitigate against some of these uh, emergencies that come. And so that brought us into um, coming up with some of the, uh, this technology. And we think that climate change is also becoming a topical issue, uh, not only in Africa, but globally. And so this is a way to also contribute to the uh, process and to provide data. Data is, uh, you know, knowledge. Once you have data, you can process it into information. Then we think that the fight against climate change uh, will be better fought. Yeah, but at this stage, the team members are there. If Emmanuel or um, Nick wants to chip in, do they have the permission to talk? I don't know if they can chip in. Yeah, uh, okay. Emmanuel can go ahead. And who you see the other person is Nick, right? Yeah, Nick, Nicholas, I think Nick, yeah, okay. any of them can chip in. Yeah. But yeah, I think that answers the question. They have been promoted. Yeah, thank you, Blaze. Just, uh, just quickly before, you know, your team members chip in, uh, I just want to open it up, guys. Uh, there is a, a Q&A um, section, so please feel free to, you know, leave any questions. Uh, I'll, I'll bring it up to Blaze and team and uh, let's, yeah. you know, uh, let's see their response. Hello, guys. Yeah. Hello. Um, sorry, I wouldn't like to start my video. My room is dark. Um, no my name is Imano Patrick. Uh, I live in Nigeria. I do not live in Potter Court. <laughs> I live oh. in Uyo. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. I, I heard you say in Potter Court all the time. I live in Uyo, Nigeria. I'm, I'm schooling at the University of Uyo, studying electrical engineering. Um, this is my final year. I know how schools can be in Nigeria sometimes. 
So we are waiting for the government to uh, end the ASU strike so that we can get back to school and finish our final year projects and graduate. So I've been involved with the Telos blockchain for uh, more, more than a year now. Been involved since 2019, November, um, October, November. So that's where I met Nick and he was talking about this climate project that we are supposed to work on. Like, okay, you wanted to come to Africa. You wanted to visit Africa to work on it. So maybe the COVID-19 came in and I was the one in Africa who was in close contact with him. So I had to help him. I started working on those projects and with my background in, elect in electrical engineering, I was able to handle most of those equipment properly because I could easily understand how to work with them. So the project is really, really interesting. I started working with it even without a reward. It was so interesting to me. It's really interesting for anybody who is in the design field because uh, whenever I do these lunches around in school, uh, we, we have a lot of students coming around asking a lot of questions. It's really interesting and it has a um, very nice solution. Blaze gave us a very nice presentation. I really love that presentation. It is really insightful, as you said. So what uh, we are looking at, we are looking at a solution that will be sustainable in Africa. And uh, living in Africa, I've never seen where people do balloon launches. I've checked around on the internet. I've never seen a place, but I think there are some places, but it's not really efficient that it should be, uh, or like it is in Europe and in the US. So this project is going to help us gather this data and store it on the blockchain, which is going to be open source and can be used by different weather companies, can be used by communities like farmers, place elaborated everything. Everything. So I don't really have much to say about the whole project again. So I'm really happy to meet you guys. I've seen that we have over 16 participants on this call. This is really interesting. So I'm really happy to meet you guys. I've been working on this for since, uh, I think since January 2018. But uh, it has been really slow, not as fast as it should be because of funding. So we have applied for funding so, uh, through uh, several bodies. Some rejected it because most, uh, most bodies in Africa may not even understand the importance of having weather data, like decentralized weather data. So the ones that are actually interested are the ones outside Africa. So we have been working on this, although um, we, we haven't gotten so much attention globally, but with that, we'll get that attention globally. Right? This is actually a nice project we can help, which can help us get data in Africa, weather data in Africa. I know how important it is. So I don't really have much to say. I'm really happy to meet you guys. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to speak. Yeah, please. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, this is Nicholas Lopez. Um, yeah, we we started this project about a little a little over a year ago, and it came with uh, the idea that we could collect data in West Africa and be able to provide uh, forecasts for hurricanes for the United States. And we see it as a really big. Um, potential for opportunity to also make forecasts locally. Um, that's one of the cool things about this project. We can, we can forecast locally, but also work towards um, developing a, a machine learning solution to be able to predict well into the future and across many thousands of miles. Um, and it's just, because, it's, it's just because this region is, just a, is such an important area for climate. Um, I, when I worked at NASA, uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, um, one of the topics that came up pretty frequently uh, when we would talk about South America actually was the importance of West African dust on um, climate in the region of, of South America in the rainforest. Um, and that's simply because the winds blow all of the, the, the dust and the, any particles um, that come off of the Harmattan winds, they eventually become, um, you know, suitable for for a rainforest to develop, you can imagine nutrients being brought across. So the region of, of West Africa is very important for global climate. Um, and it's, it's a shame that over the past uh, 30 years or so, even though radio sounds have been very important for global climate in the United States and increasingly China, they really haven't spun up in Africa, primarily because of the cost and because of the, the difficulty of being able to make sure that they get launched on a regular basis. Um, and you know that's something that we're we're really looking to explore. It's it's been amazing to me the 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 talent of uh, in Nigeria and Ghana specifically for electrical engineering. Um, I, I I've always felt like 
uh, on this whole this whole project. I, I felt like I just want to show students that this is possible. Um, I want to show them that this is actually within grasp using very low cost materials and that it can achieve a very large impact. Um, and honestly, I think I think much of the website and electrical engineering experience of West Africa is actually on par with the United States. Um, part of the web application that we use is just a really simple um, HTML form. And I just had a friend develop that for me. And, and, it, and it reminds me of the same situation that I have with a manual. You know, if I, if I need something, I just kind of ask him and see if, if it's, if, if, you know, he has the manpower to do it. Um, for instance, he has someone um, named Akanki in, uh, just outside of Uyo that also works with microcontrollers. Um, so I was able to send him a binary file. He uploads it to the ESP32 module and then, and then we can use that. So that's kind of what I'm envisioning for um, BA City Group as well is uh, kind of this collaborative project where we can really um, build things on a community basis locally and then um, provide really large climate solutions um, over time using digital currency. So, yeah, thank you so much, Blaze, for, for doing this. I'll, I'll hand this over to you, but um, we're really excited to be working with you guys. Blaze had mentioned that uh, if you guys want to, if, if anyone's interested in joining the crew, we do want to do a, a few test launches within the coming months. Um, yeah. I think there's a slide that describes uh, exactly uh, what that looks like um, in terms of timeline. But, um, uh, you know, with, with some, uh, some good, good feedback from you guys, I think we'll, we'll probably continue and, and um, provide some of the larger uh, investment cost modules so that we could really um, get these launches going and get some good results. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nick. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Blaze. I uh, really appreciate it. I'm um, just going to go over to the, to the Q&A section quickly. Uh, seems like we have a couple questions. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the first one that came in. Um, and uh, um, this, is, this is directed at uh, Blaze and team, obviously. So um, either one of you uh, that would like okay. to address it uh, free. Yeah. Um, but uh, how, how specifically do the balloons uh, measure the data sets, uh, so temperature, air pressure, humidity, et cetera, and how accurately does it measure these quantities compared with traditional weather station instruments? Great. Um, okay, yeah, let me take this. Um, so the balloons really don't measure the, the, these data sets. What we do is that we attach um, a radio sound which, or a microcontroller with sensors that pick up these data sets. So you attach that to the balloon, right? So the balloon is just a carrier of um, the, um, the sensors um, that you know, pick up all these um, data sets. And um, the sensor that we are using is um, accurate. It comes up with uh, you know, the accurate data that you, know, you would get through uh, maybe other data points. So yeah, in terms of accuracy, um, it is very accurate. And uh, most of the sensors that we are using you know, are standardized. And I don't think um, there's any variations in terms of the uh, data sets that we get. But just to emphasize that the balloon in itself doesn't pick up the data. It is a carrier of the uh, microcontroller. That's a radio sound. Thank you, Blaise. Um, I, so I was, I was curious, you know, when you talk about like predictive, uh, the ability to predict weather conditions, can you, uh, can you share, you know, like what, what magnitude of, uh, of data is required and to what, uh, what percentage, you know, uh, to what, to what percentage of confidence is the uh, mm. prediction? Um, so I'll take this and then Emmanuel and Nick can also come in. I mean, in models, uh, you would know that in most machine learning models, you need yeah, data um, over time to predict this. So, and so one, that is why we are going the decentralized way to have more communities coming up with more um, data sets in different ge um, geolocations, right? Once we have that and over, let's say, one or two years, or even three better, we can then begin to predict and um, the accuracy of our models and to train the model um, in how best to, you know, be able to um, predict the, 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 the uh, you know, impending weather conditions. But as it stands now, we need to gather the historical data um, to 
um, build um, the predictions, um, the models. But I don't know if what we have um, over the last um, one year, we've been able to build uh, any model. Um, Nick and then uh, Emmanuel can also come in to see if uh, maybe we've done so and what is the level of um, accuracy. But I think yeah, once we have um, data over time, um, I think we should be looking at maybe close to 95% accuracy because um, what the census are picking and with the um, mass uh, you know, data that we are looking at, that will give, give us more predictive power than um, traditional institutions um, and how they gather data. So because we are making it decentralized and community-based, so we can have like in a cry alone, if you have 10 um, census and they all come up with almost like the same or close to, uh, uh, you know, the same data sets with little variations, then we can say that our model and our prediction should be getting to um, much more accurate than, you know, if you had just one device uh, picking up the, the weather situation for the entire country. So that is what I'll say for now. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point about uh, being able to provide localized forecasts and being able to incorporate those localized forecasts into a larger model for the country. Um, and that's exactly what we've seen in the literature too, is that you can, you can do a launch over um, the United States, for instance, and the, the weather is dominantly um, dependent on atmospheric instability. So uh, normally when you get a thunderstorm, you get a lot of rising um, air and it's near the surface. When it's very warm, it rises. Um, but that's much different than in the tropics. So in an area like Ghana, it, rainfall and uh, thunderstorms are actually m much more dependent on mid-tropospheric humidity. That's just a fancy term for saying in the middle of the atmosphere, um, having a lot of humidity is very predictive of a rain event within like six hours or something like that. Um, so by analyzing the data in one specific location up the column, we can get a, a general sense of um, the, the predicted or the, uh, the probability of, of rain and also maybe the cloud base layer for any aviation um, enthusiasts or any, any pilot operators. Being able to get this information is really helpful for a very short term forecast. So that's why we were looking to launch these every, um, at least once a day, um, pri primarily in the morning because um, as the afternoon comes around, the afternoon is the hottest part of the day and that tends to be the most likely time for, um, for storms. And we also are targeting this time of year specifically because um, uh, many parts of Africa are have very interesting weather events um, in February through through March and April. Um, we get a lot of those Harmattan winds, those those dust storms that come through that are just very interesting for um, regional weather. So any if any any event that happens with respect to to dust is is pretty unpredictable. So what we want to be able to do is find out which atmospheric um, indices are very important um, to be able to better predict for that specific region. And in order to get there, we need about, we, it's, it's hard to estimate exactly how many we need, but in order to get the training data, we, we estimate that we need about 20 launches um, before we can actually make any predictive abilities. There's something, there's a funny thing in uh, meteorology called the steady state forecast, which is, which is just, you predict um, precisely what the weather is now in six hours into the future. And it, it's actually pretty, it's pretty, um, it's more accurate than you think, <laughs> um, even though it's, it's simply obviously no skill. So we, we anticipate within 20 launches, we'll be able to get at least um, 20 to 30% better than a city state forecast. Um, and given the lack of observations in West Africa to begin with, these observations act actually have a very strong impact, right? So um, if you have an area with, with no observations and you suddenly get one, that one observation is much more helpful to determine a forecast than if you had say a thousand observations and you got one extra. So we just, re we really see this as kind of like an, I guess the term would be an information asymmetry, right? So we can get the most bang for our buck and be able to um, collect very important data at, at super low cost and with um, done in a really transparent way where, where we're able to also build up communities and be able to, um, you know, uh, develop uh, an ecosystem around this with other universities. Um, um, and possibly if, you know, if we're, if we're lucky enough and we're successful enough, we, we have enough launches uh, far into the future to be able to use these for actual global forecasting models with supercomputers and, and all that stuff. And we actually have some work in, in Kenya. Um, we're working with uh, a company called climacell.org, 
that uh, is working with the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research here in Boulder, Colorado, in the United States. Um, and they're, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're developing this, this test to see how well these um, observations are very helpful for um, a two-day forecast on a numerical weather prediction model. So, sorry, that's a, that's a lot of technical talk, but to answer your question, it's, 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 it's qualitatively, I would say it's, it's extremely important to get these observations and they have a huge impact. It's hard to say exactly how well the forecast will improve, um, but, you know, machine learning is also an accessible um, technology as well. So, we, you know, we, we anticipate possibly holding a hackathon in maybe six or so months um, to see if we can get some of those weights for um, uh, some of the parameters that we expect to be able to determine a rain forecast. Um, so, yeah, sorry for the very long explanation, but um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question for uh, how much, you know, we anticipate to, to improve forecasting abilities there. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Really, really appreciate it. Um, guys, just so, just want to get into, you know, in terms of, uh, the uh, you know what 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 academic academic city students can expect or you know how how they should look to get involved you know um, yeah. it's it's come up you know on the on the product development side uh, that there could be you know some requirements there um, you know is that is that from a hardware side is that from a software side uh, we, you know we understand that it's a it's an um, open source software as well. Um, so if, if you could just dive into that, you know, so that so the students can understand um, specific areas that they could, you know, of interest for them uh, to uh, to get involved in. Yeah. So let me take that. I think one is uh, we're looking at the hardware side. So um, we're just having a discussion regarding how to reduce the cost. And so um, can we have um, academic city and the students, you know, assemble or um, produce alternative uh, radio sound or alternative uh, microcontrollers or, or the sensors that, you know, are cheaper and also that we can use that to then distribute regionally so that probably we don't have to be shipping them from other outside Ghana and Africa to reduce the cost because that's an overhead that we incur anytime we need to bring the sensors down. So one is how can we localize the, this um, or the hardware part, can um, the students, you know, be part of this process? And can we use um, um, Academic City, let's say, as the launch part to um, distribution, for distribution across West Africa? If you guys, I, sorry, if the institution can um, work with us, or if the students can be part of this process, we'll appreciate that. Anyway, we can reduce the hardware component, the cost, and even improve the quality um, in what we can get, you know, we are um, open to that. Uh, regarding the source code, of course, this, this was like on blockchain and if anybody wants to be part in writing the code, we can add them to our GitHub repo and then um, they can begin to also make some contributions and we are open to, be open to that. They can begin contributing to the code base. Um, so that's in terms of the hardware and the tech. Um, but also, we're also looking at the, um, the non-tech part, which is outreach and word of mouth, spreading it, and also how best we can get, you know, a critical mass behind it. And so students have that power, universities have that power. And so if we are working with you, it can be a win-win situation. Um, the students can be part of it. Let's say maybe a so student is doing um, a semester project, business student, um, communication. This can be a case study or a project for them. And then we can look at um, what are the terms, what role we can play, um, and what role the student can play. And then those are um, some of the areas we are also looking at um, um, that we can cooperate with um, the students and the university. And then, of course, the obvious is launching it um, every day or every, um, you know, that the, 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 the group wants to. So let's say they come for lectures, um, those that are available they can um, uh, launch the balloon and then get rewarded. So that's what we're also looking at, you know, active launches um, of um, the balloons and then get, so that we can get frequent and updated data on the blockchain. So yeah, those are some of the areas I would, I would look at. Um, Mr. Blaise, um, um, a quick question for you and your team. Okay. Hope you can hear me, yes. Yes. Um, I think Ms., um, Mr. Emmanuel uh, mentioned I don't know if I had his name right. I mentioned something really interested. Um, he said, uh, um, shockingly enough, the outsiders are more interested in this kind of project as compared to Africa. 
So my question is, why do you think Africans, in your case, don't pay too much interest in what you're doing? And what can you do in your part to um, change the narrative? And I want to really know you. Okay, so you please go ahead. No, you can add this, uh, the follow-up question, if you want to. Um, the follow-up question was, um, I wanted to know your target audience. Are you mostly targeting university students to mm -hmm. eat in the lunch, or is open to another specific group? So that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, so I'll start from the latter. So it is open to um, any group, so NGOs, whether NGOs, local farmer groups. Um, but we, we, we are using students because... Um, one is the, the students are usually early adopters and if you look at most um, software projects google and most of the big tech companies they started out of university so you it's usually a place where you can test some of these ideas and engage um, adoption and acceptability and so also students you know help shape the idea and you know um, due to their knowledge base they can be part of the team and grow so that's what we are using sometimes in a university campus as a um, launch pad but, that's, but as we expand, we also expect the students to be part of the process. So if we are training, let's say, a local community in um, Kumasi that wants to launch this, um, or let's say we have 10 uh, interest groups from Kumasi, we, we, have get, we want to get a team from Academic City who will travel with us or who will go to help in this kind of training process and setting it up in the education and all that. Now, the first question, um, we want to look at the interest in um, West Africa. So it's generally um, the problem of data and our level of preparedness. And, you know, in Africa, is we usually take the laid back, maybe not, yeah, in some West African countries, we seem to take the laid back approach to um, some of these issues, um, to the importance of data. And so um, we are looking at um, a way we can sensitize them. That's one. And we can do much more outreach. And if we get this data to the end users, that would generate some interest. So we are looking at if the farmer gets updated information, they like it. Um, you know, it was such a person that are we creating an impact? Yes. Um, but if we were asking of the governmental level, I think, yeah, we still have a long way to go. But in terms of the individual users, um, people are interested in weather updates. People are interested in climate data. And so that is what we uh, want to do. But by and large, changing the narrative um, is part of what we are doing. And when we launch it in um, next year, hopefully, and we want to make sure we have so much um, press coverage and to let it you know, go out to um, the, the, the um, interest groups. And we are also building a network of NGOs. We also think they are key in reaching and building up interest. So NGOs engaged in environmental activities, um, poverty alleviation, they are mostly um, um, agents to, um, you know, change. And so if we can get the NGOs on board, then they can also go to their local communities and build that interest. So um, that's what we are looking at, um, ways by which we can change um, the narrative and then get, uh, you know, whip up interest in, you know, you know weather data and reporting. Okay, um, great. Um, thank you for answering my question. I think there are some few questions um, in the question and session. I'll just read them for you. Um, okay. Someone said the notice you use TTN. Do you use private LP1 gateway as packet forwarders? If so, um, they would love to know how the LP1 coverage. Um, I think. Um... Nick is typing, or is it Emmanuel? Any of you want to take it? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I, I just sent a uh, response to that question. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so we, we use the Things Network, which is a, a Laura One network. Uh, right now we're using Ursalink gateways that simply forward packets to um, a server in Europe that then uh, gets sent to our cloud and then um, gets sent to the blockchain. So it's, it's, very, it's a very messy network architecture. Um, I think one of the questions, uh, well, so let me first conclude that by saying we're, we're looking to improve that. If anyone has any experience um, with LoRaWAN, it's, it's really helpful. Um, I think that one of the questions that someone, that uh, another question that he asked was also, what, what is the coverage like for LP1? Um, I've, we've been very impressed with, with how far they go. Um, uh, LP1, if, if anyone hasn't heard the term, is just a low powered network. So um, it's similar to say something like Wi-Fi, um, but where you're using very low power and very long distances. So this is actually a computer networking technology. You, 
you can kind of uh, kind of affiliate it with kind of like a zero G, right? So you have, you know, you have a, you have three G networks, four G networks, five G. Um, at some point, uh, a company called Semtech decided to uh, research chips that transmit very long distances over, um, uh, you know, small amounts of data over very large distances with low power. And this is kind of, kind of the result. Um, and because of that technology, we're able to get a line of sight with the balloon for, um, you know, five plus kilometers. Um, and it's, it's able to reach the, the top of the troposphere. There was, there was someone that works at um, a, a company called Lacuna Space that actually got, interested, got me interested in this project originally. And he tested his LP1 satellites um, by first putting them on a weather balloon and then watching the, the balloon um, travel across Europe and being, get picked up by a whole bunch of gateways. Um, <laughs> that's actually, on a personal note, that's actually what got me interested in this because of uh, my prior work with a weather satellite. Um, but the LP1 technology really does work far in, in West Africa as well because, um, well, for a couple of reasons, there's the ocean to the south. So um, you can see, uh, you know, like the, the shape of Africa allow, like Accra is obviously on the coast, um, which allows packets to be sent very far distances. And in fact, in Uyo, which is also in near the coast, it's in Southern Nigeria. Um, we've been seeing packets pick up from Europe um, simply because they, they bounce off the ionosphere and eventually get to our gateways. Um, so that's one reason. Another reason is that there's, a, a, there's not that much background noise, right? So we're, we're operating on, on an ISM band um, that is normally very heavily trafficked in Europe and the US, but in Africa, um, there isn't as much um, infrastructure that uses that, that band specifically. So we're able to pick up signals for um, just a little bit further, which is, which is really cool. Um, I would say that Africa has that advantage um, of being able to use these really low powered, um, long range uh, networking technologies because there isn't as much yet. It's one of those um, things where if everyone's talking on the network at the same time, no one's going to be able to understand each other and, and the receivers aren't going to be able to collect the data. Um, so that's another uh, really great thing that I see with um, some of these LoRaWAN technologies um, kind of really possibly getting picked up in, in West Africa and, and, and any remote area that uh, has, has you know, 3G coverage or doesn't have direct Ethernet access to the Internet. And let me just add, um, so maybe on the cooperation, I think uh, Prof mentioned like possible areas of cooperation. This is something that if any student, you know, knows how best to work with us to improve it, maybe through research or something, um, or better ways to do this, you know, we are open to it. So yes, it's something that we are looking to improve and we're interested. So an opportunity just identified. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, I think so. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Blaze. Um, let me just ask uh, Dorcas, did you have another question? Sorry. Um, I, I don't. Um, so um, Barnabas, um, if you're still here, um, um, so can you please share your email again? So Barnabas, you can contact them after this. I see yeah, in the question and answer you're actually interested. So they will just um, respond to you as you go on. Um, I think a quick question on my ad is I want to know your method of marketing, like how you get this information about your project to people. Do you specifically target like the people you want to target and like relay the information to them or you have like a special department in your um, organization or corporation who does the marketing? I think this is something that, as you said, the university students the business yeah, or yeah. communication students be willing to yeah, um, yeah. help you out with. So I just yeah, wanted I think, to know. Yeah, we are still a small team. And so I, one of the areas of cooperation I mentioned was um, if students want to take this probably in a semester project on communication, how we can uh, spread the word about it, we are open to that. So we don't have a department for that. And so we multitask and then we do that on our own as well as um, developing. But what we are looking at is um, um, building networks like this. Um, so that's where our strength is. It's a low cost approach to getting uh, you know, your product out. And so we are building networks with you and with Academic City, um, the brand you have, 
then you know we can also um, build this and it will be a win-win we, we co-produce we co-design and then we co-market things like that so that's what we are looking at um, and so but if we have a, a bigger budget in future as we um, grow and, and and sell it then we can have such department but as it stands um, it's just multi-tax and it's a smaller team so we are um, doing this um, you know using um, word of mouth and also um, you know organic you know um, growth um, strategy so if there's any way or anybody has a quick um, growth hacking PR strategy, we are also looking forward to that. So any student who has maybe wants to join in that regard, we can um, also discuss that. Hello. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Blaze. Um, so guys, we've, we've gone past 7 p.m. Past, yeah. um, Unless there's, unless there's any, you know, further questions. Um, can you, can you hear me, Les? Yeah, I can hear you. I think, okay. um, sorry, yeah. No, no, so, so, so I, I, I just wanted to, you know, uh, close things up. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's, you know, there's, there's definitely more questions. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, I think this is a great opportunity for our students. You know, we've identified from the engineering, you know, from the uh, from the IT side, from the communications, from the business and commercialization side. There's you know, there's opportunities for our students to get involved. Um, so I think you know, to our students, uh, if you're if you're looking to get involved, um, you can reach out to Mousy in Career Service or in our Student Life and Career Services. Um, she will, you know, she'll help put you in touch with Blaze and team. And I think Blaze and team have also included uh, their contact below. Um, I believe it's, uh, or Blaze, I'll pass it over to you to just quickly highlight that. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Prof, for um, coordinating this. And um, we are looking forward to, you know, working closely with you and developing this um, together. And also, we always believe in the power of universities um, and, and, you know, working to, um, you know, grow projects like this. And so um, we want to go beyond this webinar, um, launch this together. And then, you know, in the future, you know, as I said, have academic city and the students play a critical role in um, our engineering and code based process. That's if we, um, the students are interested. For us, we are open and um, our doors are open to that. We are willing to co um, cooperate with you. And so um, thank you once again. And this may not be the um, last. We continue to have more engagements with ACT, um, more especially after you return to campus. Uh, maybe we should be having more in-person interactions. And so thank you once again, and thank you to everybody who made time to join this. Um, we appreciate your feedback, your comments. And so, um, yeah, innovation starts like this, sessions like this. And so um, let us keep building, let us keep innovating, and let us keep interacting. Thank you, everybody. And then we look forward to uh, working with you. Thank you, Blaze. Really, really okay. appreciate that. Okay. Um, just, uh, just on the academic city side, I just want to thank, you know, Dorcas uh, from, the, from the business club that joined us earlier and helped um, facilitate some of this conversation. Uh, so really appreciate that, Dorcas. Um, and again, just to, just to stress, guys, if, uh, if, if any of the students want to get involved, you know, reach out to Mousy and Student Life. Uh, she, can, she can help uh, put you in touch with the Lazen team. Um, and, you know, we're excited through, through the Academic City, you know, Tech and Entrepreneurship Center. We're looking to partner with more entrepreneurs, uh, such as in his team, um, and really, you know, bring innovative projects to, to the school, you know, and um, opportunities for students, you know, to, uh, to really just, you know, expand their horizons, right, and really just think outside the box, um, utilize, you know, some of the uh, theoretical and practical learning, you know, from the classroom and really apply it into a real world or a community setting. Um, so, so stay tuned and continue to look out for, for updates from uh, the Tech and Entrepreneurship Center. Um, and thank you, thank you to everyone who participated, you know, as, as uh, Blaze mentioned. Thank you to uh, Blaze and team, you know, thank you to the Academic City team. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. All right. Yeah, I would just All right. Have a good night.